Hello, I'm Dr. Peggy Bertrand from the University of Tennessee. Today, we'll be talking about RC circuits, focusing on connecting measurement and mathematics. During this lesson, I'm gonna ask you to make predictions and write them down occasionally. So pause the video and get a notebook and pen so you'll be ready. Here you see a schematic of an RC circuit set up to both charge and discharge a capacitor. This circuit has a battery, a capacitor, a resistor, and a switch. The single pole double throw switch allows this circuit to both charge and discharge. The capacitor has capacitance C, the resistor is ohmic with resistance R, and the battery is ideal with an EMF of epsilon. RC circuits charge and discharge with predictable time constants, which we can calculate as shown. They're useful in devices requiring reliable timing, such as pacemakers, strobe lights, that sort of thing. Our objectives today are to measure the behavior of RC circuits as a function of time, derive equations that predict the behavior of RC circuits as a function of time, and finally, we're gonna connect what we measure to what we derive. Let's talk about measurement tools. Ammeters are tools that measure current. We'll be using conventional current in this lesson, which is defined as the flow of positive charge. You probably know that electrons, which are negative, are the actual charge carriers in a circuit. So conventional current is in the opposite direction of the movement of electrons. An ammeter is a very low resistance device that is wired in series with other components in a circuit so that current actually passes through it. Here is an example of a simple circuit containing a battery, a light bulb, and an ammeter. The ammeter in this circuit reads positive 3.2 milliamperes. Now this is another circuit that has a negative reading of identical magnitude. What do you see in the arrangement of the circuit components that would account for the difference in sign? Well, hopefully you notice the battery has opposite polarity in the two circuits. Could this be the cause? Well, an ammeter has a positive terminal and a negative or COM for common ground terminal. A red lead is by convention connected to the positive terminal and a black lead to the negative. We're going to stick to this convention because this is gonna allow us to use red as shorthand for positive and black as shorthand for negative. If the current passes through the ammeter from red to black, the ammeter reading is positive. This explains the circuit on the left. Current leaves the positive terminal of the battery, enters the ammeter through the red lead, exits through the black lead, travels through the bulb and back to the battery's negative terminal. If current passes through the ammeter in the opposite direction, as in the circuit to the right, through the black lead and out the red, the ammeter reading will be negative. If you look at the circuit on the right, current leaves the positive terminal of the battery and then goes through the bulb first, through the black lead, out the ammeter through the red lead, leading to the negative reading. The sign of the ammeter reading can be used to designate the direction of current through the meter, so we can use the sign as a valuable tool. Voltmeters are tools that measure electric potential difference, commonly referred to as voltage, and for convenience, I'm going to occasionally use voltage as my term. Unlike ammeters, voltmeters are very high resistance devices, and they're not part of a circuit. To measure the electric potential difference between two points in a circuit, you place the leads of the voltmeter on those two points and make solid electrical contact. Here is an example of a simple circuit with a battery and a light bulb. The voltmeter is measuring the electric potential difference between two points on opposite sides of the bulb and it reads 1.5 volts. For, that's typical of a AA cell. Here is a similar circuit in which the voltmeter reads negative 1.5 volts. Again, the battery has opposite polarity in the two circuits. Like an ammeter, a voltmeter has a positive terminal and a negative terminal. The red lead is connected to positive and the black to negative for consistency. 
If the red lead is at higher electric potential than the black, the voltmeter reads an, a positive value. If the reverse is true and the red lead is at a lower electric potential than the black, the voltmeter reading will be negative. The sign of the voltmeter reading gives us information about the relative location of positive and negative charges in a charge configuration. That's important for capacitors. It also gives us information about high and low potential points in a circuit. That's important for resistors and also for batteries. Voltmeters are the most valuable tool we have in the investigation of circuits. They're very flexible. Let's focus on this RC circuit now. I've added three voltmeters to the circuit across the battery, capacitor, and resistor, and I'm using colored dots to indicate the positions of the red and black leads. Now I've added three ammeters to the three vertical wires using colored dots again to indicate the position of the red and black leads. The capacitor is uncharged. The switch is in the position shown. Predict the readings for each meter in terms of, in terms of epsilon, the EMF of the battery, C, the capacitance, and R, the resistance. Pause the video while you write down your predictions. Let's look at the voltmeter across the battery first. It's displaying the battery's EMF, which is also its terminal voltage in this case, because we're gonna use an ideal battery here that doesn't have any resistance in it. And um, whether current is flowing through this uh, battery or not, it's going to read positive epsilon. The positive value indicating that the red lead of the voltmeter is near the positive plate or the positive terminal rather of this battery. All the other meters are gonna read zero. There's no current in the circuit because it's an open circuit. So there's no current to charge the capacitor and make a potential difference across that. There's no current to flow through the resistor resulting in a potential difference from one end of the resistor to the other. So everything reads zero here. Now let's look at charging the capacitor. We do this by moving the switch to position A. The switch is gonna remain in position A until the capacitor becomes fully charged. It starts out uncharged. Predict the direction of the current and also the initial and final readings for each meter in terms of epsilon, C, and R. Pause the video while you write down your predictions. Counterclockwise conventional current will move from the positive to the negative terminal of the battery, and it'll go in the path shown on the outside edges of the circuit. And meter two, will show a constant reading of zero because there's no current through this branch of the circuit. Voltmeter C over the capacitor initially reads zero because the capacitor starts out uncharged. Current does not flow through the capacitor. So positive charge begins to build up on the right plate and negative charge is induced on the negative, uh, negative charge is induced on the left plate equal and opposite positive and negative charges on these two plates. The increasing accumulation of charge on the plates sustains the current that flows to the capacitor and from the capacitor through the wires. The final voltmeter reading for the capacitor will be negative epsilon. This is because current exists and the capacitor charges until its voltage reaches the voltage of the battery and fully opposes it. The negative sign is because the red lead of the meter is near the negative plate of the capacitor and the black lead is near the positive. Now let's turn our attention to the resistor. Current moves in this resistor from, well, in all resistors actually, from high or positive to low or negative potential. So I'm labeling the ends of the resistor positive and negative to indicate that. Initially, the voltmeter reads negative uh, uh, epsilon or negative the EMF of the battery. Because there is no voltage across the capacitor initially, the battery's entire voltage is available to the resistor. 
the reading is negative because the black lead is at high potential and the red is at low potential. The final reading for the voltmeter across the resistor is zero. Let's talk about this in terms of uh, a concept related to energy conservation because potential difference is related to energy. The voltages across the capacitor and resistor must add up to be the terminal voltage of the battery. As the capacitor charges with its voltage increasing, the resistor's voltage must simultaneously decrease so that the sum stays the same. When fully charged, the capacitor's voltage is negative epsilon and the resistor's voltage therefore must be zero. There are other ways to explain this, but I decided to use sort of a uh, conservation of energy approach. Ammeters one and three have the same meter reading because current is the same everywhere in this circuit. In both cases, current enters the red lead and exits the black, so the readings will be positive. Because the voltage across the resistor has magnitude epsilon when the switch is first closed, Ohm's law tells us that the initial current through the resistor must be epsilon divided by R. That's the same current as we see in the ammeters. And again, they're positive because of the position of the leads. The readings are positive. Now the readings of these ammeters will approach zero as current is proportional to the potential difference across the resistor. As delta, uh, as, as V sub R approaches zero, the reading on the meter across the resistor, so does the current. Let's do the same thing for the discharge cycle. Let's assume the capacitor is fully charged. The switch is now moved to position B and remains there until the capacitor becomes fully discharged. Predict the initial and final readings for each meter in terms of epsilon, C, and R. Pause the video while you write down your predictions. The battery is no longer in the circuit. And the source of the current is now the charged capacitor. Current moves clockwise from its positive plate to its negative plate. The capacitor's initial voltage for the discharge cycle is the same as its final voltage for the charge cycle, so it's negative epsilon. As the capacitor discharges, its voltage drops to zero. No current goes through ammeter three so it reads zero the entire time. It's not part of the circuit. Current moves from high potential to low potential upward through this resistor, and I've labeled high potential with a positive and low potential with a negative. The voltmeter reading initially reads positive epsilon. Now there are only two components in this circuit that uh, change the potential difference. Uh, that would be the capacitor and the resistor. So the entire voltage provided by the capacitor is available to the resistor. The reversal of the current means that the red lead is at the high potential and, uh, end of the resistor and the black lead is at the low potential end. So it's readings positive. The final reading of this voltmeter is zero. The capacitor and resistor will have opposing voltages of the same magnitude throughout this discharge cycle. The ammeters will now need read negative values because the current is entering the black lead and exiting the red lead. The value of this reading, the magnitude of it, is going to be epsilon divided by R initially. That's when the potential across the resistor is epsilon, so we use Ohm's law, and we get that the current must be epsilon divided by R. There is no current in the ammeter when the capacitor is fully discharged, so their final reading is zero. We've been looking just at the initial and final conditions of these capacitors. Now let's take a look at the entire charge and discharge cycle. This will be easiest if we look at graphs, and if you've worked with capacitors in laboratory, uh, this will be a refresher for you. Let's assume we take an initially uncharged capacitor and do the following. We move the switch to position A to charge the capacitor, 
at time t0. We keep the switch in place for long enough to allow the capacitor to fully charge. Then we move the switch to position B at time T1. We allow the capacitor to, to fully discharge. And during this process, we take um, probeware and we graph the data coming out of the meters that are across the capacitor and resistor and also the ammeters. Uh, I'm going to show you three graphs, and I'm going to see if you can match the graphs that I show you with the meters that produce them. Here are my three graphs. Now, in these graphs, the first half represents the charge cycle, and the second half is the discharge cycle of the RC circuit. The horizontal axis is time axis. And you can find where the zero point on the vertical axis is by looking for the zero next to the vertical axis. The vertical axis can be in terms of either current or voltage or potential difference. Pause the video while you select the meter that you think produced each of these graphs. Here are my choices. Look at graph one first, because it's kind of different from the others. It shows a reading of zero at the beginning of the charge cycle. The capacitor voltage is the only reading that is zero at the beginning of the charge cycle. So this must be the graph of the voltmeter that's across the capacitor. Now, let's check and see if it's consistent with the capacitor behavior throughout. The reading on the voltmeter across the capacitor will approach a maximum negative value as the capacitor charges. You can look at the leads to determine that. For the discharge cycle, the reading becomes less negative and approaches zero as the capacitor loses charge and voltage. So it's consistent. The other two graphs are a little bit trickier. Current through the ammeters and voltmeters uh, um, and the voltage across the resistor follows the same pattern, being largest at the beginning of each cycle and approaching zero, zero as the current dies out. Ammeter and resistor voltmeter readings both have different signs for the charge and discharge cycle. At first glance, graph two looks like it could belong to voltmeter R across the resistor or ammeter one. We can't work with ammeter two or ammeter three because they don't read current for both cycles. So we've narrowed it down to voltmeter R or N meter one. The key is the sign of the reading. Graph one has a positive reading for the charge cycle and a negative reading for the discharge cycle. This makes it consistent with N meter one, which reads positive current for the charge cycle and negative current for the discharge. By process of elimination, graph three goes to voltmeter R, which has a negative reading for the charge cycle and a positive reading for the discharge cycle. How'd you do? Now, let's talk about sign a little bit more. Suppose you want ammeter one, which produces graph two, to produce graph three instead. How would you accomplish this? Pause the video while you write down your answer. Well, there are two ways to do it. And the first, I'll illustrate that again because it went kind of fast. The first is to switch the position of the voltmeter leads. Okay, and that will switch the sign of the readings. The second way to do this is to switch the polarity of the battery and flip the battery around the other way. Suppose you want V sub C, the, the voltmeter across the capacitor, to produce graph four instead of graph one. How would you accomplish this? Pause the video. Well, you do basically the same sorts of things. You would switch the position of the red and black leads, or you would flip the battery around the other way. Now we come to the part that I must confess I like a lot, which is the derivations of the mathematics. We are gonna derive functions for the charge cycle of the capacitor. We're gonna use physics, which is the most important part, by the way, 
and then calculus, and some algebra as well. Here you see the RC circuit during charge cycle. At time T0, when the switch is first moved to position A, the capacitor is uncharged. We've seen that this means conventional current moves counterclockwise in the circuit, causing potential differences to exist over the resistor and capacitor. These change with time. High potential areas here are labeled with positive signs and low potential with negative signs. I'm adding three voltmeters to the circuit. The potential difference or voltage we measure with these voltmeters is proportional to electric potential energy and to electric energy in general. Um, the battery converts chemical potential energy into electric potential energy that drives the current in the circuit. The capacitor stores electric potential energy as it charges up. And uh, the resistor converts electrical energy to thermal energy that is removed from the circuit. Now, if you look at where the black and red leads are positioned, you can see that all these meters have been set up to read only positive values of potential difference during the charge cycle. Note that this required a, a reversal of the leads for the voltmeters across the resistor and capacitor from what we had in previous circuits. Do we need ammeters? Not really. We can learn everything we need to know about a circuit from the voltmeters. We're going to be using something called Kirchhoff's um, loop rule to set up our mathematical analysis. The goal is to derive time functions for V sub C and V sub R, which are the readings on the voltmeters for the capacitor and resistor for the charge cycle. Why are we doing this? Because I can actually test my derivations using data if I graph the voltmeter readings. I'll model this derivation for you step by step. For the discharge cycle, I'm going to specifically encourage you at given points to perform the steps yourself. Now, if you've done a derivation similar to this one before, I strongly encourage you to pause the video now and do the derivation on your own. When you are finished, continue the video and compare your method to mine. There is a lot of variation in how this can be done. Equation one illustrates Kirchhoff's first rule mathematically. It states that the sum of potential differences or potential changes when one makes a complete loop around a circuit is zero. What we're going to do is we're going to look at each term in this uh, law individually. Let's start with the battery. We're going to start at the negative terminal of the battery and move in the direction of current through the battery to the positive terminal. We can see that delta V sub epsilon, the potential change across the battery, will be positive since we are moving from low potential to high potential. Our next component is the capacitor. When we move across the capacitor in the direction of current, we go from high potential to low potential, and thus delta V sub C is going to be negative. Now the voltmeter reading is positive, but the fundamental physical quantity, the potential change across the capacitor is negative. Now we go on to the resistor. Delta V sub R, the potential change across the resistor, is also negative. Resistors always experience what we sometimes call a potential drop when you move across them in the direction of conventional current. Again, the reading on the voltmeter is positive, but the potential change is negative. In equation two, we've substituted our meter readings for the potential changes. Uh, remember, the meter readings represent actual data, the measurements. The voltmeters are all set up to read positive values during the charge cycle. So when we substitute the meter readings into equation one, we have to apply negative signs to the readings for the capacitor and resistor. Each of the meter readings represents something fundamental about the components measuring. So let's take a closer look at that. First, the battery. The meter reading across the battery, which is the same for the battery as the potential change, is equal to the EMF of the battery. This is also the terminal voltage since we are using an ideal battery and there's no internal resistance. For the capacitor, 
But the potential difference across the capacitor, the magnitude of that, is the positive charge on the uh, capacitor divided by the capacitance. This is fundamental to capacitors. When we get to the resistor, we're going to use Ohm's law. So V sub R is equal to I R. Current is the charge that passes through the cross section, this, uh, any particular cross section in the circuit per unit time. Um, current can be represented by delta Q over delta T if the current is constant. But in this particular circuit, as you saw from the graphs, it's not constant. So we have to use the differential expression dQ dt for the current because the current is charging the capacitor. Q also represents the accumulated positive charge on the capacitor at time t. The next thing I'm going to do is substitute these fundamental relationships into this equation. And I get equation three, which is a differential equation. We call it a differential equation because it contains both the variable Q and its derivative with respect to time. And it, it basically is the equation that we can solve to tell us all sorts of things about this circuit. Solving it directly will yield a time-dependent function for Q, the charge on the capacitor, as it increases during the charge cycle. So the next step is algebra. I've simply multiplied both sides of the equation by C, but there was a method to my madness. The product RC has made an appearance here, and that's the capacitive time constant which we know has something to do with how rapidly the capacitor charges and discharges. We need a little bit more algebra to arrive at equation four. Equation four is um, an integrable equation. How do I know I can integrate it? Well, dq and q, uh, the variable q, are both on the left side of the equation, and dt for time is on the right-hand side of the equation. So the variables have been appropriately separated on opposite sides of this equation. Setting up the integral means I'm applying limits to it. I have a preference for definite integrals because they always go from the start to the end of a particular mathematical function or physical phenomenon. So we set up this equation with the limits shown. The charge on the capacitor goes from its lower limit of zero for the uncharged capacitor to its upper limit of Q, which is, which is its value at time T. Time, on the other hand, goes from the initial time T zero to T. We're using variables and not constants for the upper limits of the integral because we are deriving a function and not a final value. Continuing our derivation, the next step is to integrate equation five. Now I'm gonna show you my solution. Integration of the left side of the equation yields a natural log function. You might be experienced enough in calculus to pop this right out, but if not, don't worry. You can use any tools at your disposal, such as integral tables or a uh, a graph, uh, you know, a special calculator, one of those powerful algebra cal calculators. Uh, you can look up integral tables on the internet. Um, if you're taking calculus, you might learn to integrate this equation using integration by substitution, which is a lot of fun, but we don't have time to do that here. Remember, this is physics and not calculus. Calculus is a good tool for us. The right side of the equation integrates far more easily than the left. We then evaluate our integrated expressions at the upper and lower limits. You'll need to know the logarithm rules to do this appropriately for the left side of the equation. We then apply an exponential function to each side of the equation. This allows us to remove the natural log function. We do a little more algebra and we come up with equation six. Equation six, is the function for the charge on the capacitor as a function of time during the charge cycle of the RC circuit. Now remember, 
I'm going for V sub C, the voltmeter reading on the capacitor as a function of time. To get that, I know that if I divide everything by C, um, the left-hand side of equation six will become the potential, um, the reading on the, on the uh, voltmeter, which is gonna read a positive potential. Um, and I also uh, come up with equation seven, which I can later test. Epsilon is the EMF of the battery, V sub C is the reading on the voltmeter, and RC is the time constant of the circuit. Now, to determine V sub R, which is the second equation I want to derive, I go back to equation two, I do some solving for V sub R, I do some substitution of the values that I know, and I wind up with V sub R, epsilon times this exponential term that you see here. All right, how'd you do? What we're gonna do now is move to the discharge circuit. Now, the discharge circuit is actually mathematically a little bit easier than the charge circuit. The battery is not in the circuit. The capacitor is the source of the clockwise current. The capacitor will be fully charged, and I'm using a capital Q to indicate the charge on the capacitor at this point. The voltmeter reads a potential difference of epsilon when the discharge process begins at time t. Pause the video now and see if you can write an equation for Kirchhoff's loop rule for the discharge circuit. We're looking for one equation. Here's our equation. The uh, sum of the potential changes for the loop is zero. And that's going to be equal to uh, the change in potential across the capacitor plus the change in uh, potential across the resistor. Or, you know, and the interesting thing about this, the battery's out of circuit, so now I only have two terms. I know that one of them has to be positive and one of them has to be negative. We'll take a look at the capacitor first. Because the current is now moving from low potential to high potential, I know that delta V sub C is got to be a positive term. If I look at the potential across the resistor, delta V sub R is a negative term because in the direction of current, I'm going from high potential to low potential. Now, the reading on this meter will be negative. So if you will, try substituting the meter readings into equation one to get an equation that describes a relationship between the meter readings. Keep in mind, V sub R is carrying its negative sign with it. Does this surprise you? Remember, V sub R is a negative number. And so the capacitor, which uh, volt voltage reading, which is positive, and the negative voltage across the resistor will actually sum to be zero. So I don't add a negative sign this time. It comes with the, var with the constant or the variable. So here's equation two. In the next three steps, I will derive a differential equation for the discharge cycle. Pause the video if you wanna try this first. Okay, the capacitor voltage is, as it was before, the charge on the capacitor divided by the capacitance. I'm using Ohm's law again in the way I did before to uh, derive an expression for the potential difference across the um, uh, resistor, V sub R, the reading on the resistor. Now, dQ over dT, remember, that's the quantity uh, that is describing the change in the charge on the capacitor. Because the capacitor is losing charge, dQ dt is negative. This is very good because Vr is also negative. So we don't have to worry about our signs here. They are absolutely correct. I substitute these numbers into the differential equation and I get this, or into the equation two and I get my differential equation. I'm sorry, equation three is my differential equation. All right, pause the video. If you want to try 
going from this differential equation all the way to the equation I can integrate, including limits. In the next step, I've multiplied both sides of the equation by C to get my capacitive time constant to make an appearance. I've done a little algebra and I wind up with equation four, which can be integrated because the variables are separated. And here is my integral equation with the appropriate limits. The capacitor goes from maximum charge Q to lowercase q at time t. This surprises some of my students because I'm using a larger lower limit than the upper limit. Avoid the temptation to always think the lower limit of integration has to be smaller than the upper limit of integration. That's a common way to get into trouble with integrals. The upper limit is q, which is the charge on the capacitor at time t. I mentioned that already. Time is integrated from T1 to T. Let's continue the derivation. Pause the video and see if you can integrate both sides of equation five, five and perform all the steps needed to develop an equation for Q, the charge on the capacitor as a function of time. Integration of the left side of the equation yields the natural log function. This time it's much simpler than it was in the charge cycle. Integration of the right side of the equation yields a function that is linear with t. Um, we are evaluating that equation at the upper and lower limits of integration. A little more algebra. And here is equation six, the charge on the capacitor as a function of time during the discharge cycle. Pause the video if you want to take this all the way home. Uh, you want to derive the expressions for V sub C and V sub R, the readings on the meters, as functions of time. One hint, you must find an appropriate substitution for Q because we can't use Q in our equation. We don't know what it is numerically. Here is what I've done. I've divided both sides of the equation by C Substitution leads to equation seven. Remember, if I divide charge by capacitance, I get potential difference or voltage. When I uh, divide charge by capacitance on the left side of the equation, I get the reading on the meter. When I divide capital Q, the maximum charge, by the capacitance, I get the maximum voltage across the capacitor, which is epsilon or the EMF of the battery. I'm going to draw on equation two again to solve for R. And when my substitution happens, I get an equation for the reading on the resistor as a function of time. All right, now let's do the really fun stuff. We're going to co connect our mathematical derivations with the measurements that we get on an actual RC circuit. This is data for the charge and discharge voltages in an RC circuit. The capacitor used in this circuit is a 1000 microfarad capacitor, which is also 0.001 farads. We got to remember that because we can't use microfarads to calculate the time constant. The resistor is a 15,000 ohm resistor. I calculate the time constant of this capacitor as 15 seconds. There are some other things I can obtain from this graph. Epsilon, or the voltage on the battery, looks to me to be about 1.55 volts, and that's either on the charge or discharge cycle. It's also the, uh, it's also the asymptote that the capacitor is approaching when it charges up. T sub zero, the time that charging begins is five seconds from according to the graph. I can also identify T1, the time that the discharge begins. So all of this comes from the graph. And there's something more. I can identify and create a data table of various T 
the points. In other words, I can read for each of these curves values of their potential or their reading as a function of time. I can read individual points and plot them. So this is what I did in the modeling program, Desmos. I'm powering this with Desmos. And the link to the Desmos site is on this slide. What I did here is to put in the data points I extracted from the graph and uh, plotted them. I plotted the capacitor points in blue and the resistor points in red. Then I derived, I took our derived equations and applied them to on this particular graph to see how well they matched the data points. Now, to actually graph them, I needed to substitute in the numeric values I extracted from the previous graph. So here, here you'll see the equations as I actually graphed them. You'll notice that the time constant is in the denominator of the exponential term. You'll notice T0 is five seconds, T1 is 109 seconds, and the EMF of the battery epsilon is 1.55 volts. So all of these data came from the graph. As I look at the curve, it looks pretty good, but the variance between the plotted points and the curve suggested to me that there was some error in the time constant. Because the capacitance was given to just one significant figure, and the resistance to two significant figures, and we're assuming our meters are all ideal and our battery is all ideal, um, I decided to see if I could find a better time constant. To me, it looked like the time constant needed to be a little bigger. I found a good time constant in 18 seconds, which is 20% higher than the one I obtained by the product of R and C. I think this is a pretty nice fit. It suggests that the actual resistance and or capacitance in the circuit was higher than expected. Perhaps there was resistance in the wires, or maybe the battery had enough internal resistance to be a factor. We're now finished with our exploration of the measurement and mathematics of RC circuits. I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you for your attention.